Hey there, it's Kenny. Today, we're going to talk about one of the coolest voyages in history, Jing Ho's Voyages to the West, or Ming Treasure Voyages. Now, I know what you're thinking, who's Jing Ho? Well, let me tell you, he was one of the greatest explorers of all time. He was a Chinese admiral who led a fleet of massive treasure ships on seven voyages to Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, and East Africa during the early 15th century. So, get ready to set sail with me as we explore the fascinating world of Jing Ho's Voyages to the West. From the exotic lands he visited to the amazing feats of navigation and shipbuilding, we'll discover why his voyages were such a big deal and how they continue to inspire us today. So, grab your compass and let's embark on this incredible voyage together. Zheng Hor was a famous Chinese explorer, diplomat, and eunuch in the Ming Dynasty. Zheng Hor was born Ma Hor in 1371 in Kunyang County, Yunnan Province, China. He was later renamed Zheng Hor by the Ming Emperor. Zheng Hor was a remarkable figure in Chinese history. He led seven expeditions to the west between 1405 and 1433, which were collectively known as the Treasure Voyages. These voyages lasted for 28 years and covered a distance of over 70,000 miles, visiting more than 30 countries and regions in the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean. Jing Hor was not only an explorer but also a skilled diplomat. He brought back exotic goods and animals from his voyages and established diplomatic relations with foreign countries. He even brought giraffes and zebras back to China, which amazed the Chinese people since they had never seen such creatures before. Jing Hor's life was full of twists and turns. When he was only 10 years old, his father was killed by Ming troops during a military campaign in Yunnan, and Zheng Hor was captured and sent to Nanjing as a eunuch. Despite his lowly status, Zheng Ho rose to become a trusted advisor of the Ming Emperor. Zheng Ho was a physically imposing figure, standing at 9 feet tall with a waist circumference of 10 feet. He was known for his military prowess, strategic thinking, and intelligence. The Ming Emperor recognized Zheng Ho's talents and appointed him to lead the treasure voyages. Zheng Ho's expeditions were a remarkable achievement in Chinese history, and they took place long before the European Age of Exploration. His voyages were a testament to the advanced shipbuilding and navigational skills of the Chinese people during the Ming Dynasty. In recognition of his contributions, the Ming Emperor bestowed the surname Zheng on Ma Ho, and he became known as Zheng Ho. He was also promoted to the rank of an imperial guard and became one of the most powerful units in the Ming court. Now, you might be wondering why the Ming Emperor spent so much time, effort, and resources on sending Zheng Ho on these expeditions. Well, there are various theories as to why this happened, but unfortunately, we don't have concrete evidence to support any of them due to the destruction of the original documents and relics after Zheng Ho's death. Some scholars suggest that one of the main reasons for Zheng Ho's voyages was to promote China's national prestige. The Ming Dynasty was focused on stabilizing the country during the early years of its rule, which led to a gradual weakening of its relations with other countries. As China's power grew under the Ming Emperor, the aim was to establish a strong diplomatic presence abroad and elevate China's status in the world. Zheng Ho's voyages were a significant step towards achieving this goal. Another reason for Zheng Ho's voyages was to establish friendly relations with neighboring countries. China had a unique worldview that it was the center of the world and the surrounding lands were barbaric. As a result, China had the responsibility to guide and uplift these countries. The Ming Dynasty's rulers adopted this philosophy and they wanted to project China as a benevolent nation that wanted to establish friendly relations with other countries. Zheng Ho's voyages were a way to do this by establishing China as a nation of etiquette and righteousness. Some scholars also suggest that expanding trade was one of the reasons for Zheng Horse voyages. The voyages did result in extensive trade activities between China and the Western countries, but it was not the primary objective of the expeditions. During that time, China's economy was still primarily agricultural, and the commercial and industrial sectors were not developed enough to warrant exploring overseas markets. The trade activities that occurred during Zheng Ho's voyages were mainly official tribute trade, which focused on building friendly relationships rather than profit. 
Finally, there's a theory that Jing Ho's voyages were to find the whereabouts of Jin Wen Emperor, who was rumored to have escaped and fled overseas after being overthrown. However, this theory is not widely accepted since the Emperor was known for his weakness and his escape would not have posed a significant threat to the Ming Emperor's rule. Jing Ho's voyages to the West were a significant undertaking with multiple objectives. They were a way to promote China's national prestige, establish friendly relations with neighboring countries, and explore trade opportunities. Regardless of the reasons behind these expeditions, Zheng Ho's voyages remain an important part of Chinese history and a testament to the country's advanced shipbuilding and navigational skills during the Ming Dynasty. Let me tell you Zheng Ho's voyages and the advanced navigation techniques used by his fleet during those epic journeys. Some scholars have pointed out that Zheng Ho's seven voyages to the west during the early 15th century were a high-level demonstration and review of the world's maritime civilization. In fact, many of the techniques used by Zheng Ho's fleet were more advanced than those used by famous European navigators of that time. Firstly, Zheng Ho's fleet used multiple methods for determining their ship's position. They employed depth measurement to determine the water depth and the type of bottom sediment to infer the water level and determine the turning points of their expected sailing route. They also used visual positioning, using landmarks on the coast or islands to determine their ship's relative position. This technique evolved from single-point positioning to three-point crossing positioning to determine the route to Huangshan. Also, Jing Ho's fleet used astronomical positioning by measuring the height of stars, such as the North Star or the Canopus with the starboard to determine their ship's latitude. The starboard was made of 12 pieces of ebony, gradually larger in size, marked with fine engravings, and numbered like inches. However, at the time, China did not yet apply the concept of longitude to navigation and mapping. So, geographical locations were mainly marked by the star's height index. Secondly, Zheng Ho's fleet used multiple navigation techniques. Firstly, they used land-based navigation, using landmarks like mountains on the land to navigate. This technique was more practical in small-scale waterways. The Zheng Ho navigation chart not only includes the mountains and rivers on land, islands, and some landmark buildings used for navigation, but also illustrates many sailing routes, indicating the direction of travel, water depth, sailing distance, and the position of dangerous shoals and reefs. It is, in fact, a simple navigation guide. Additionally, Zheng Ho's fleet used celestial navigation, using the starboard and starboard technique to observe the positions of the sun, moon, and stars at different seasons and times to determine the direction and the ship's geographical latitude and north-south direction. This brought celestial navigation to a more specific and precise level, far richer and meticulous than Western contemporaries like Columbus. Thirdly, the fleet used nautical charts and sailing guides extensively, creating a needle pathway system with the meaning of calculating and correcting the track. This needle path technique used a magnetic compass to determine the heading, a knot meter to determine the distance, and pre-calculated the displacement factors such as winds and pressure differences in the approach area to ensure that the planned sailing track matched the actual sailing track demonstrating the achievements of China's traditional needle path calculation and correction techniques. During the voyages, as long as they followed the chart, the calculation and counting were accurate and the results were always reached. Now, let's talk about the end of Zheng Ho's voyages to the west during the Ming Dynasty. You see, after Young Lok Emperor, the naval power of the Ming Dynasty started to decline which was one of the main reasons why the voyages came to an end. The rise of the navy was the material foundation of these voyages, and without it, they became like a house of cards with no sturdy foundation. The decline of the navy was a sign that the Ming Dynasty had shifted its focus to the northern borders, where the defense of the capital city far surpassed that of the southern coast. The threat of invasion from the north by the Mongols and Jurchens was a constant worry for the Ming Dynasty, and despite Young Lok Emperor's three campaigns, the dynasty was unable to deliver a fatal blow to its northern aggressors. Instead, the constant wars and the cost of moving the capital led to financial deficits, and taxes began to decrease during the reign of Zunda Emperor. As a result of this financial crisis, subsequent monarchs had to cut back on non-essential spending, and unfortunately, the navy was one of the first things to go. Even though there 
there were attacks by Japanese pirates on the southern coast, the Ming government could only respond passively. General Yu Dayu proposed using the navy to eliminate the pirates, but his plan was not adopted by the court. Some historians have argued that the voyages were stopped because of opposition from the civil officials who saw them as an unnecessary expense that burdened the people. However, this argument doesn't hold water because the voyages were not solely carried out by the eunuch Admiral Zheng Ho and his associates. Shipbuilding, navigation, and foreign trade were all part of the general knowledge of the time, and they reflected the general demands of society. Furthermore, shipbuilding and other industries needed the cooperation of local officials. Jing Hor himself had good relationships with high-ranking officials in the capital, and there was no opportunity for them to create any animosity between them. The real conflict between the civil officials and eunuchs did not start until later during the reign of Zheng Tong Emperor. Another argument is that the voyages were stopped because they were too expensive, and the Ming government couldn't afford them. However, shipbuilding costs were relatively low compared to the overall expenses of the government. For example, the cost of building one treasure ship was only about 1,000 stones of rice, while Soju, a major tax center, had a tax collection of 3 million stones of rice annually. The real reason why the voyages were stopped was that the civil officials saw them as an unnecessary expense during a time of financial crisis. The relocation of the capital to Beijing, the construction of official buildings, and the prolonged war with the Mongols resulted in a sharp increase in government expenditures during the Ming Dynasty. The civil officials believed that the government should abandon the voyages and focus on solving the financial problems instead. Hey everyone, that's a wrap on our adventure through the world of Zheng Hor's voyages to the west. I hope you had as much fun learning about this amazing explorer as I did sharing his story with you. Before we part ways, I want to take a moment to say thank you for watching and supporting my channel. Your likes and subscriptions are what keep me motivated to create more videos about Chinese history, culture, and artifacts. So, if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and give it a thumbs up. And remember, I'm here to serve you, my audience. So, if there's a specific topic or aspect of Chinese history that you're dying to hear about, let me know in the comments below and I'll do my best to make it happen in a future video. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.